Her own anointing. 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 Her own. Hello and welcome to Her Own Anointing Podcast, where we educate, support, and highlight women who are doing awesome works in ministry, especially those women who serve or have a connection to the Churches of Christ or Restoration Movement Churches. I am your host, Dr. Lana, your favorite professor and public theologian, and maybe even one day your favorite podcaster. Today, it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Jennifer Schroeder. Dr. Jennifer Schroeder is an accomplished musician, teacher, and scholar, and she has been serving in congregational ministry for the last two decades. She holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in music from the University of North Texas, a doctorate from Michigan State University, and a master's degree from Lubbock Christian University, and a doctor of ministry degree from Abilene Christian University. Prior to coming to Abilene, Jennifer served in children's ministry in congregations in Garland, Plano, and Houston, Texas. And most recently, she served as the children's minister at North Atlanta Church of Christ in Georgia for six years. Jennifer began adjunct teaching at ACU in 2019, but has been full-time at ACU since 2022. She serves as the summit director for the Cybert Institute, College Fellow for Children and Family Ministry in the Bible Department, and the Director for the Center for Women in Christian Ministry. Help me welcome Dr. Jennifer Schroeder. Welcome, Jennifer. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for coming. Now, what we always do first, we want to make sure we get the nerves out. So we want to start off with a quick little icebreaker. It'll just be a couple of would you rather questions. So the first one is, out of all of Jesus's miracles, which one of his miracles would you have loved to see in person and why? Out of all of Jesus's miracles, which one would you have loved to see in person and why? That's a really good question. Um, so I wouldn't classify it as one of his miracles, but it, but it's one that has always stood out to me because in the world of children's ministry, it's one that we get, we talk about a lot is Jesus walking on water. Yes. And I think that one would have been really fascinating because in the grand scheme of things, it is a, um, it is something that we can't imagine how it possibly could have happened or possibly could have worked and yet to be there in that presence and watch as he walked across the water, I think would have just in my mind, um, really been impactful, uh, really kind of solidified just the amazing presence that we had in the incarnate God, um, at that time. You know what? The funny thing is that was actually the miracle that I was going to, to pick as well. And I I just honestly want to see it. I wouldn't want to be on the boat, but I would just maybe want to watch from the shore or something like that. But that was actually the miracle that I, I would want to see as well. I probably would. I would probably love to have a firsthand seat at really any of them. But that one would definitely be one I would want to see also. Um, who would you rather have in your Sunday school class? Jacob, who wrestled with the angel? Or Peter, who chopped the man's ear off? Who would you rather have in your Sunday school class? <laughs> what? Okay, that's good. Okay, I'm going to take the easy way out and say both. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so, and it's not to attempt to avoid to answer the question as is. But Jacob, from the standpoint of, I like, I like the idea of wrestling. And one mm-hmm. of the things we talk about a lot in this world of children's ministry is how do we wrestle with the text and wrestle with the difficult ideas and wrestle with the things that challenge us. And so I think somebody who comes comes to the class with a spirit of wrestling means we're going to be challenged and we're going to be asked to think more deeply. And so I like that notion. And then Peter, um, there's just a strength and a certainty with which he acts, even in his most difficult moments, you know, even in the things that we don't think are so great about um, what Peter did and and how he responded and, you know, the denying of Jesus and all of that. But in all of that, what we do see in Peter is just this, um, this 
strength is not the right word, but this kind of desire to act and desire to, to push forward. And I don't know, there's something to me endearing about that, even if he isn't always getting it right. Mm, yes, absolutely. Good answer. Good answer. Good Thank answer. You. <laughs> um, last one. If you had to go to dinner with a woman biblical character, which biblical woman would you rather have dinner with and why? Oh, that's a good one. Because I really, there's like a bunch that come to mind. Okay. I'm going to say, I'm going to say two, I'm going to say two different ones. One would be, uh, and this is just really a ridiculous reason, but one would be Junia to Mm. see how she felt about her name being wrong. Um, in uh, translated yes. scripture for so many years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there's one. Um, and then I would say, um, I would say really, and it's a grouping of one, uh, Shifra and Pua, uh, mm-hmm. the midwives um, right. in, um, in uh, the land of Egypt, because I really, I don't know, I admire the strength that they demonstrated through their small part of the story. And so I would just want to just kind of sit with them and, and talk with them about that, about what that looked like and what that felt like and, and how they navigated through such a difficult time um, in uh, the Old Testament and such a difficult time in history. That was such an awesome answer. Wow, that's great. That's wonderful. Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, you know, when we talk about like who we would want to have dinner with, it would be like... E- even, you know, to, to, for lack of a better term, like women who are considered like mainstream uh, women mm-hmm. characters, but to, to call them out um, who would be considered minor biblical characters for a lot of people who have a lot of people who may not have even heard their name. I think that is, um, that is important. And it's an important message that comes out of that as well. Oh, that was awesome. Great. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so as we start to get into, so we we talked about your biography um, um, at the beginning. So tell us a little bit about your your background um, and how that background really just kind of led into your journey into ministry. Like, tell us about that. Um, how did that all come together? Yeah. So um, I always kind of get a little bit embarrassed when I when I hear either a little bit of embarrassed or a little bit self-conscious when I hear kind of my listing of degrees. But when you hear the story behind why there are so many, um, it kind of makes sense to me. And it really is part of this greater story of being a female serving in ministry. Mm-hmm. So when I went to college, women mm-hmm. didn't go into ministry. Yes. Um, and so I grew up, uh, my parents were both musicians and I grew up trained as a classical musician And when I got ready to go off to college, I said, okay, I want to go into ministry. And they said, great. What does that look like? I'm like, I have no idea. Right. Because when I went to college, uh, especially at the Church of Christ universities, um, and those would be the ones that I really would have considered because my entire faith background was formed within the Churches of Christ. Right. Um, Women... um, could my, maybe go get a missions degree with the intent that they would marry a missionary, mm-hmm. but they really didn't go into the world of Bible. And so when I presented that to my parents, they were really supportive, but none of us could figure out what that looked like. Right. So I just started getting degrees. And because I had grown up as a musician, that's just kind of what I did. Um, I loved it. I, I love music. It speaks to my soul. But that's why, you know, I went, I got a bachelor's and a master's and a doctorate all in music performance back to back to back. And basically I would get done with one and I'd go, okay, now what do I do? And, um, and there was no really clear path. And so I just start the next degree. And so that's why that's what that looked like. And as I came home um, to finish up my dissertation on uh, my first doctorate, I moved back to the area where my parents were living and just started going to the church where they attended. And it was a pretty large church of Christ. And at it, they had um, two full-time female children's ministers. Wow. And I'm like, oh, that's what this can look like. Mm -hmm. Um, Not because children's ministry was kind of the appropriate place for the females to be, but because I really felt called 
to what does this look like to intentionally minister to this group of people, this age group of people? Um, you know, having taught a lot in Bible class growing up, having really been engaged with um, our children in the church I grew up in, it felt like a very natural fit for me. Mm-hmm. And so that's why when I saw that, it felt like the natural fit for me. So I started volunteering there and then was hired on um, to work as one of the staff members within their children's ministry before I got my full, uh, my first full-time job working in children's ministry. And then from there, I um, rec- recognized kind of an area of gap in, um, in um, how do I minister to families. And so I got a master's in family studies from Lovett Christian, again, mm-hmm. just to kind of fill that gap, to feel like I was better equipped to serve mm-hmm. in this role. Um, and then just kept working and working and working. And from there, um, got an MDiv equivalency at um, ACU and moved into my doctorate and got my doctorate of ministry degree. Um, and so as a result, began adjuncting here at ACU in 2019 um, because they had a children's ministry program, but really wanted to be more intentional with what does that look like? And mm-hmm. so I was blessed to get to start working here and um, while also continuing to serve in ministry full-time and then moved full-time in 2022 to be at ACU to help train and equip this next generation of children's ministers because we have more churches open to the idea of what does a woman serving in ministry look like and whether that is children's ministry or um, women's ministry or youth ministry or even now we have some women moving into this role of executive minister and Mm -hmm. um, imagining what does that look like to be called into ministry, to serve in your area of giftedness Mm -hmm. and not in an area that just is okay because you're female. Mm -hmm. But what does it look like to bring the giftedness that God has blessed you with to Mm -hmm. the table? And Mm -hmm. so um, while I do hold a number of roles here at ACU, um, and I'm proud of each and every one of them, you know, the the work I get to do teaching undergrad uh, Bible students is amazing and it's life-giving because Mm -hmm. we get to imagine what does their role as a minister look like Um, but also as summit director i get to work and working here with the cyber institute i get to sit down with churches and church leaders Mm -hmm. and help create space for female voices to Mm -hmm. serve in leadership but also to help leadership and in churches imagine what does it mean to lean into giftedness Mm-hmm. And then um, for as my role for the as the director for the Center for Women in Christian Ministry, our students here on campus, whether they're going to serve formally or informally at their churches in ministry, I'm creating a space where they get to grow their voice and grow their talent and equip them and walk alongside them in both the the good moments and the more challenging moments. And so um, that's been kind of what my background has looked like and where I am to today. And it's a lot of fun and it's really, um, it's life giving to me and it's impactful to me, Mm -hmm. but I think I only have the perspective I do because I, I traveled such a circuitous route to get here. Now you mentioned like traveling this circuitous route and, and you mentioned like wanting to like knowing, you know, really before college that you wanted to go into ministry. But, you know, as has been the story of many women that I have talked to, especially women who have a background in the search of Christ, it's like, well, you know, practically, what does that look like for me? And you ultimately did find um, a, a, find a way that that could possibly look like for you. But, but take us, if you can, um, kind of to that moment because it sounds like even before you found a practical way of actually like fulfilling that calling that, you know, you knew before then that you were called to ministry. So how did you, or when did you know that you were actually called to do ministry work? Yeah. So, um, and that's a good question. And it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, some of it came, you know, I was that, I was that person who was always there at the church. Mm -hmm. And my dad started out as a deacon and then became an elder at our church. And I was always there. My mother always taught in different Bible classes and such. So that, um, that, that space was always a space 
that felt normal for me because I was always there. But he also was one of our song leaders. And um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this because I think at the time that this was happening, it would have been frowned upon, but he was one of our primary song leaders. And so when he would sit down to put together his song service, he mm. and I would sit down together mm-hmm. and we talk about the song service. And he's like, well, what do you think I should sing? You know, here's what the preacher is going to preach on. What do you think? You know, and he would take me through those processes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that was incredibly formative for me mm-hmm. at the same time. Um, my, I still, and this goes even back a little bit further. My grandfather was a farmer in West Texas. Mm-hmm. And I, for the longest time, I was the only girl and a bunch of boy cousins and me. Mm-hmm. And we would sit at the feet of my grandfather and we'd talk about his day. And we'd, we'd talk about um, the impact that God had on his life because he grew up in a Lutheran faith tradition. Mm-hmm. And when he and my grandma got married and they started talking about, well, what does this look like for our family? Um, he said to, he said to her, the most important thing to me is that my kids know Jesus. Mm. And those words like mm. just resonated with me and stood, yeah. stood um, embedded in me from the time I was a little child. And so as I grew up and um, kept being involved at our church, to me, that resonated with me. The most important thing is that my kids know Jesus. Mm. And so there were a number of summers there that we had a college intern who, um, who served uh, in, our, in our youth group. You know, as many churches do, they have interns that come in and serve. And he took us to a bunch of different um, service opportunities. And within those service opportunities, that desire in me to serve more deeply to be more intentional, to be more present and an active part in shaping what was occurring just grew. And so I came away from each of those summers just feeling called Mm -hmm. to ministry in a way that I couldn't put language to other than to say, I want to go into ministry. And so I was blessed. I think, like I said, I was blessed to have parents Mm -hmm. that were really supportive and, um, knew that this wasn't just a whim. And while they also couldn't put language to it, they believed in um, the giftedness that God had blessed me with. And they believed in my heart, uh, my heart's desire and my calling. And so at each kind of turn in the road, each, each kind of fork in the road, until we could place um, a name to it, Um, They just kept encouraging me. And when we finally figured it out and I said, okay, here's what this looks like. They're like, okay, you know, we support this fully, even though we know maybe some of our former church uh, family, um, maybe some of our own personal family may not support this in the way that it's going to look. We support you fully. And so that just gave me the courage to keep moving forward in it. So it sounds like you had, you know, really awesome, supportive uh, family, um, especially in your um, immediate family. Um, But you did mention how, you know, it, they did consider or did think about like, well, you know, maybe we, well, we support you, even if, you know, the people around us may have a different view. And, um, you know, sometimes those different views do kind of like impact our experience, especially as women in, in ministry. And so what has it been like for you being a woman in ministry? What obstacles, what triumphs, what progress, what has it been like for you, um, experientially as a woman in ministry? Yeah, and I've got a long answer to that. So if you need to interrupt me, please don't hesitate. Um, You know, it's been, I would love to say it has been all roses. Um, It it hasn't. Um, And there have been some really um, positive moments, but there have been some really difficult ones as well. Um, You know, I have worked at churches where I have been the children's director or the children's coordinator. Mm. um, And... And in, in, in each of those churches are, and both of the, it was two different churches, and both of them were amazing churches. 
with really um, amazing families that I got to work with. And ultimately, I kind of had to wrestle with this, um, the tension that exists between knowing that I'm serving as a minister, Mm -hmm. but not being, but not being allowed into the same space as my male colleagues. Absolutely. And, you know, so that might mean um, it's an elders meeting and I'm asked to, after we do the introductory prayer that says, you know, what do you need us to pray for? I'm asked to leave the room Mm. when the real conversations happen or the real decisions get made, even if they're about my area of ministry. And that's been a really um, present part of my experience. Um, I have also been... um, the minister who has, um, who, when, um, and this, this sounds like an awful story to tell, and I don't mean it to be awful, but, but it's a, it's a real one. It's the reality right. of this who, um, who, when, um, all of the other male ministers are buried in their office, deep at work, Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm doing the same thing and I'm evidently deep at work. I may have a a host of commentaries laid out on my desk and it's obvious by anybody just glancing in the, um, the uh, window that I'm hard at work um, that uh, one of the administrative coordinators will barge in to interrupt what I'm doing and stop what I'm doing to take care of something that they need. And when I would bring it up and say, you know, I, I'm always happy to help. I'll be honest, it really wasn't the greatest time for you to interrupt. Um, I was deep in thought, you know, and and I will gently kind of ask that question of of noticing, of curiosity that it hasn't happened to my male counterparts. Their mm-hmm. response is, well, because they're doing the real work for the adults. Wow. Um, and, and I know they don't mean it in, in as hurtful of a way as it is, but it, I'll be honest. It's hurtful. And, and, you know, unfortunately I have more examples like that than Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. um, because that's just a really real part of being a female in ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an unconscious bias at play, um, whether um, my male colleagues realize it, whether the leadership of the church realizes it, um, you know, when North Atlanta went through the their season of discernment with respect to women's roles within the congregation, mm-hmm. what does that look like? You know, are we going to expand the role of women within leadership of our congregation? Um, after they went through that process of discernment, um, our, our leaders, our elders said, hey, we really want to be held accountable to this. Mm-hmm. We want um, we want you to um, to be to feel confident saying, hey, I don't think you are living into this the way you're trying to. Hmm. And they really challenged the female ministers on staff. And there were three of us, the female ministers on staff to um, to hold them accountable. And so I still remember um, a meeting I was sitting in and it was all of the male ministers and the female ministers. So all the ministers on staff, it was a couple of year round male interns and it was a couple of elders. And they were asking some different questions and we were talking about some just really practical elements of what does this transition into a more expanded gender roles um, in leadership look like. Mm -hmm. And so they were asking questions and I, um, I got my brave hat on because sometimes it takes me a while to, to, to step into a space of courage. And Mm -hmm. so I got my brave hat on And I said, I'm about to ask a question I don't actually know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I said, um, who all in this room has been taken to lunch or to breakfast by one of the elders here at the church? Mm. And every hand in the room raised except for the three female ministers. Wow. Wow. And here's the thing, even the male interns, the people who weren't full-time on staff, their hands raised as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I made the point to the elders, I'm like, here is this first space that we've got to correct. If you truly want to say that you are treating us 
on this level playing field that you want to hear our voices. You want to hear our experiences Mm -hmm. right now. I want you to look around and notice that I've been on staff by that point. I had been on staff for like five years. Mm -hmm. Um, The one who had been there longer than me was like seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was three years. Mm -hmm. And in our tenure there, not a single one of the three of us had been engaged in that deep of conversation Wow. with our leadership as all of our male counterparts. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so they had not, I don't think they had done so intentionally. Right. But there are these unconscious biases at play mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. really shape the way um, leadership as a female in ministry looks mm-hmm. versus leadership as a male in ministry. So for example, when I preach from a pulpit, which I don't do a ton, but I do do on occasion, um, I have been, um, I have been talked to about what I have chosen to wear, um, whether I have chosen to wear a skirt versus pants. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, I don't wear anything that comes anywhere close to above my knee. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just, it's just not in my nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm always really thoughtful about what I wear anyway, but whether it's considered to be um, a skirt versus pants whether it is a dress that may be viewed as a little more form fitting than not. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, by all stretch of the imagination, I tend to be just a much more naturally um, um, less flashy person as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get talked about what I choose to wear. Um, I get conversations about choosing to be a working mom versus Mm -hmm. a mom that works inside the home. Right. Um, my, right. my husband and I have four kids and mm-hmm. we have chosen based on my calling for ministry. We have chosen to have him be the parent that works inside the home mm-hmm. and me be the parent that works outside of the home versus the flip. Mm-hmm. And, and I get, I get talked to a lot about that just wow. simply as being the female ministry. And mm-hmm. so there are a lot of those things that I have to navigate and I've had to develop really thick skin Mm -hmm. Um, and I've had to figure out how do I respond in a way of love and of patience Mm -hmm. and a way of hopefully helping that person think about something from a little different perspective than they might have originally. Wow. That was, that was so powerful to, to, to hear all of those um, experiences. And I know that there are probably several other women um, in ministry who have had, um, who really had like those, um, those exact same or very, very similar, um, similar, um, experiences. But in the, in the midst of all of that, I guess, um, what I wonder as well is, um, you know, since you know that you are the one, um, who's, who's called to, to ministry, what are some of the things that you are like working on, um, ministry projects or, you know, things that you've worked on in the past or that you're currently working on that you, you know, that you're passionate about that, that, you know, that you feel are valuable for people to know about in terms of your ministry work? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, a lot of my projects and stuff center around, uh, children's ministry because that's my, my main area of focus. And Mm -hmm. so one of the things kind of as my, my, um, side sort of, uh, you know, project of, of sorts that, that, that Dubs tell, Dub tells into that is because I am called into children's ministry. I want, um, I want females to not to number one, not feel like they have to go into children's ministry because mm-hmm. that's kind of the pre-approved area. But at the same time, if they're called there, not, right. not feel like that is a settling because right. there is a hugely valuable need mm-hmm. for us to um, be in that space as well. Um, and so because of that, in my center here for women in Christian ministry, and just even in the work that I do with churches and with other women serving in ministry, I try to find spaces to empower them, um, mm-hmm. to elevate their voices. And so I'm able to do that somewhat through my direct my position as a summit director, because one of our values that we hold really core here in the Cybert Institute 
is the beauty of a diversity of voices, Mm -hmm. diversity of voices, experiences, and perspectives. And so when I'm putting together um, speaking panels or Mm -hmm. when I am um, asking different people to lead in different areas, Mm -hmm. I talk with them specifically about what does it look like to make sure we have a multiplicity of voices Mm -hmm. um, recommended here and represented here. Um, and that we're listening to those, not just that we're making space for them, but we're, that we're allowing those voices to speak into our decisions and into our practices. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that's really important. And so for the women that I get to minister to here on campus, we explore what that looks like. Um, mm-hmm. Personally speaking, one of the things that I do is I accept um, more preaching opportunities than I probably normally would Mm -hmm. um, because I consider myself more a teacher than a preacher. Um, We've got some beautifully gifted female preachers. You know, I think of uh, Amy McLaughlin Shesby. Mm -hmm. I think of uh, Amy Bost. I Mm -hmm. think of uh, Cynthia Ownby. Um, I I know I'm leaving. um, I just spoke with today, Sherelle Russell. We've got some beautifully gifted female preachers. Um, Mm -hmm. And I consider myself more of a teacher, but I accept more of those than perhaps I normally would, because to me, it's really important that both our, our daughters and our sons, our men and our women see that um, presence in a different space and start imagining a, a, a more accurate and a fuller perspective of what the kingdom of God looks like. Awesome. So, so I want to um, dig a little deeper into some of the things you said. So, especially like if, you know, if people are wanting to, to work with you in, in a way. So tell us more about the, the congr- congregational um, work that you do. Um, and then also tell us more about um, the summit, the work um, of the summit. Yeah, so um, here um, I work as part of the Cybert Institute for Church Ministry, and Mm. that is a nonprofit organization within Abilene Christian University, and we partner with churches on any number of things. And so me specifically, when I'm working with churches, I'm working in a few different areas that are kind of my specialty, um, that are where I spend the most of my time Uh, doing research and doing work. And that's children's ministry. That is um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What does it look like Mm -hmm. to to have our our churches um, speak more fully, again, into a multiplicity of voices? But then also, how do I equip churches and church leaders to um, move closer into... um, um, bringing women into leadership positions in churches. Right, right. And that comes directly through the Cyber Institute. And so if there's a church or there's um, an individual that's wanting more information on what that could look like, and I'm not the only one that does that through the Cyber Institute, then they could reach out to us here um, at ACU at cyber, you know, it's cyberinstitute.org and find more information on how to do that. And so whether that's a church or an individual, that's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. And then uh, Summit is our, it used to be more of a traditional lectureship model, but that has shifted over the last few years. And it's where we bring people out to campus and they are able to either um, participate in sessions that look more like a traditional lectureship model um, or they're able to dive fully into a ministry community. And mm-hmm. so this last year, what we did is we had um, we had a general interest session, and that was the more traditional model. Um, and then we had preaching, adult formation, Hispanic ministry, children's ministry, um, missions, and small church. Mm-hmm. And so what we did is we brought in leaders in those areas, and then they put together um, speakers and panels to create uh, this this um, kind of learning community is the best way to, to describe it for different people who serve in that area. 
And as part of Summit, then we had a gathering um, for our women in ministry. And that comes through our women, our Community for Women Ministers group that um, is primarily um, people from Churches of Christ or Restoration Movement churches. We've mm -hmm. got a Facebook group for that. And so we put together offerings for that on the front end of Summit and the back end of Summit so that not only could our women who serve in ministry have an opportunity to connect with each other, but right. also then participate in the areas of ministry that they serve within their congregations. Awesome. Awesome. So thinking about all of the work that you have done, all of the work that you're currently doing, two parts. What do you want your legacy to be? And what message do you have for women and girls who are coming into this ministry game after you? What would you have to say to them? Okay, my legacy, I think, hits, to me, hits really close both to home, but also then expands outward. It's that I want, you know, so when North Atlanta made our kind of our shift, our expansion of, of roles of women in, in leadership there and in, in worship service practices, I had a lot of people come up to me and say, I want my daughters to see this. Mm -hmm. And what I said is I agree, but I want my sons to see this as well. I mm -hmm. want them to feel like that this is normal. Um, this is normal. Yeah. yeah. That this yeah. is, this is what God's, this is what God's kingdom looks like right. on earth as it is in heaven. Right. And so my legacy is whether I'm talking about in my own personal family space or in any church I serve in, either formally or um, as a very involved and invested volunteer and member, that I'm helping to create and foster opportunities for both our sons and our daughters to view this as normal, to view mm -hmm. this as, you know, what does God call me to do? Where mm -hmm. does God call me to serve? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that then kind of dovetails into this idea of um, what do I want for the little girls and the women coming after me? I want it to be easier for them. Mm. Um, I have had this question asked of me a number of times of why did I stay? Because mm. I'm going to be honest, when North Atlanta went through that process of discernment, and, I, and I'm going to say something that I have expressed to the elders there. So this isn't new. This isn't something that's a revelation mm -hmm. here. I felt like we should have gone further than what mm -hmm. we did. Mm -hmm. And I told my elders that. Um, and so as I had this conversation with different people, they said, well, then why do you stay? Why are you still a part of this? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think it comes back to that, that idea of, I want this because I love this faith community. I love this faith tradition. This is what I have mm -hmm. known. Right. This is who I am and is what has shaped me. And I think it has made me, I hope it has made me a strong follower of Christ. Um, and so because of that, for those who are part of this faith community, I want it to be easier for them in five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years from now. Right. And so I, I, that's what I hope for. That's what I want my legacy to be. Awesome. And what an awesome legacy that would be to to have for those who come after you to um, to see women serving in ministry as as normal and um, for both women and men to um, see that and um, to make the path easier for the women coming after you. I think that is absolutely awesome. If they want to support your work or what you're doing, do you have a website or um, social media for them to contact you? Um, how do um, others who want to support you, how can they do that? Yeah, probably the easiest thing to do is to, um, you can find me on the summit, the summit part of this, you can find me on the cyber website. Um, and so if, even if you don't want to dig too differently, too difficult, uh, dig too deeply, sorry, my words are leaving me today. Just go to cyberinstitute.org. And mm -hmm. if you hit all, if you hit contact our team, then that um, will send you um, will allow you to find me, um, and from there will allow you to connect 
with our different um, social media channels. Um, and I think that's probably um, the most organizational way to do it, but also shoot me an email at ACU. I would love to visit with you. I would love to be in conversation with you, to pray with you, to pray for you, to help you in any way that I can. And so that is just jennifer.schroeder at acu.edu. Um, jennifer.schroeder at acu.edu. And truly, even if you have never met me in your life, I am sincere when I say do not hesitate to reach out to me because I would love to visit with you and pray for you and pray with you. Absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. This is the story of the woman of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And thank you for listening to her own anointing podcast. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Her own anointing. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Her Own Anointing. Please be sure to like and comment on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as a form of professional, legal, medical, or mental health advice. Hence, we do not, hence, we are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liability, or liabilities that may arise from the use of this podcast.